Hey folks, welcome back. So last time we looked at the core rulebook for the Last Unicorn Games version of Star Trek The Next Generation RPG. And I'm doing this all as kind of a build up to talking about Star Trek Adventures from Modiphius. And I know some of you out there are thinking, well, Thor, my man, why don't you just talk about Star Trek Adventures? I think the reason why I'm going through all this is that Star Trek Adventures have been successful at a very different style of kind of simulating the Star Trek experience. Um, and I don't think it's so obvious necessarily how they're doing that and why it works so well uh, until you go through the past of the, the previous sort of more successful versions of the Star Trek role-playing experience. Now, obviously, there's also the FASA version from the 80s, which I never played. I don't know anything about. I'm not going to pretend to know anything about it. But I do have, as I said, the last Unicorn game stuff. I have the Decipher stuff. So we'll take a look at that. What they're doing in these games is more of a, a simulationist kind of approach, right? They say, all right. Um, let's think about characters in Star Trek. Let's think about the skills they have, the things they do. We'll let them have those things and do have skills in those things. And what do the spaceships do? What sort of systems do they have? They'll fly around and they'll use those systems and the players will make them happen. And we'll kind of simulate the Star Trek world. We'll see what happens, right? But that's not what Star Trek Adventures does. So we're going to look at the earlier approach first. And I think both have their merits. You know, there are times where I don't want necessarily a narrative take on a given genre. Sometimes I like the idea of a simulationist approach, you know, when it comes to especially things like cyberpunk and sci-fi. And I have a special place in my heart, especially for the last Unicorn Games Star Trek RPG. I think it's really well done. So we're gonna, what we're going to do today, we're going to take a quick, a quick look at the supplements for the Next Generation version. So first we'll look at the player's guide, then we'll take a little break, then we'll look at the Price of Freedom, which is the United Federation of Planets sourcebook. Um, and you'll see kind of the key stuff that adds to the game, and that, you know, again, these are not so expensive to acquire. Um, of course, you can find the PDFs all over the place for free because it's been long out of print. But, you know, with any RPG, I recommend if you really want to play it, you really want to understand it, get the hardcover or, or softcover, whatever the original was, sit down and read it, and then play it with the book by your side because you know I'm, I'm still old school in that I play most of my games online but uh, I like to have the book by my side it's easier to find what I need you know I feel like I'm, I'm I've got this kind of tactile interaction with the game and these games are out of print they're old but they're not expensive and that that's a key so anyway we'll do the play, player's guide first and this again shows us the kind of simulationist approach that this game is taking right so if we look at the back so what are we offered here? We're getting an expanded character creation system with dozens of new options for Starfleet officers, right? So more pathways through the Starfleet system. Advanced training programs for characters to attend from the Advanced Tactical School to the Vulcan Science Academy. All right. Eight new alien species, including the Benzites, Napians, and Zach Dorn. I don't even know who they are. 12 new psionic powers. Conversion notes for using minis and ground encounters and ship-to-ship -ship battles. New skills, specializations, and traits. New rules for explosions, medicines, range combat options, and Starship Renown. And a new setting and a new series style, which introduces Starbase 315. And it's 160 pages in full color, which is really nice. Um, it's actually a really nice little player's guide addition to the game. It brings everything the player wants in this sort of system. you got more options, more stuff, you know, more things to think about in character creation, you know, more fiddly bits that you can add to your character to make them your own. Um, but it has stuff that expands the scope of the game a little bit as well for the GM with that new Starbase setting. But um, it's a lot shorter than the core book, so we, we won't spend as long, hopefully, <laughs> flipping through it. Uh, you can see this was printed back in June 1999, so we're still at the end of the 90s here. You know, next gen, I think, is, is probably wrapped by this point. We're into, you know, the DS9, Voyager era, but still TNG, I mean, its impact on Star Trek cannot be overstated. I mean, it's still my favorite series out of all of them. Um, I've watched it dozens of times, and uh, it had a huge impact on my life as a youth. So when I'm playing Star Trek, that's the era I want to play. So when I look for supplements for the LUG system, it's usually TNG stuff. Um, plus, there weren't that many for the other versions, frankly. So what do we got here? We got in the TOC, we have an introduction, life in Starfleet, expanded character creation, which is quite a few pages, as you can see. Um, new alien species, another 20 pages or so. Uh, options for enlisted personnel, new psychic powers, psionic powers, uh, new character archetypes, using minis, uh, some new rules for stuff not specified, <laughs> and the Starbase 315 setting. Um, so we'll just dump, jump right into it. So it says, most of the material contained herein is considered optional and you're not required to use it in your game sessions. But for those players who want more detailed guidelines or expanded options, this book provides you with a starting point. 
So, you know, again, uh, this is designed to be uh, something to give you more options for your player characters. And it says as well, the, the standard rule zero, right? If you need a rule to suit your game and it's not included here, find a related rule and use a little ingenuity. After all, this is your game. So there you go. Um, we'll skip over the description of the chapters because we kind of did that ourselves. So there's a little bit more detail in here about life in Starfleet, which is helpful for your characters. You know, thinking about their backgrounds. Um, when, you, when you set their templates, their overlays, their tours of duty, what does that actually mean for them? In practice, you know, what, what are the general orders and regulations that they have to follow? Uh, more info on that is always helpful for the player character because it know, they know now kind of they can put themselves in their character's shoes and think about, well, what is general order one, the prime directive? What does that really mean to me? What is it for? What is it? Why does the Federation make me deal with this all the time? And then it has the other general orders here, right? So general order two, Starfleet, Starfleet officers and agents shall at all times protect the life and liberty of the citizens of the United Federation of Planets. Okay. Uh, General Order 3, in the event of catastrophe, the commanding officer is authorized to order the destruction of the ship. So that's why we have the self-destruction procedure. Uh, General Order 4, Starfleet authorizes any and all commanding officers to countermand Starfleet regulations in the event of an extreme threat to Federation security. That's a key one. That, got, that one gets Kirk out of a lot of trouble. <laughs> Uh, General Order 5, commanding officers shall safeguard the safety and liberty of crew members and civilians under their command. So all this kind of stuff, you know, it lays out more of Starfleet's reasoning for their general orders. These are the principles that you must follow, right? These are the things that if you don't follow these principles, you shall be in major trouble. Like General Order 10, take no hostile action unless responding to a hostile action. So you should not fire first in a confrontation. If you do, um, that could be a big problem. That could be a court-martial type of problem. They also have a nice little thing, little sidebar here, a day in the life of Captain Bill Cross, commanding officer of the USS Gallant. So, you know, end sleep period, 5.30, workout period, breakfast, meeting with Commander Garrett about ship status, daily report, you know, all this kind of stuff that he goes through in the typical day. And he begins sleep period again at 11 o'clock. So it's a tight schedule for a captain. There's a lot going on. He's getting tactical updates. He's got a few meal breaks here and there. But really, a lot of his day is sort of catching up with Starfleet, uh, intelligence as well, making sure that, you know, his ship in the best possible, possible condition, um, getting updates from every division, making sure the ship is running smoothly. So all this is great detail um, that helps char uh, character and player characters, rather, uh, establish their place in the universe and understand what their daily orders are going to be like. What are they going to be hearing from the captain? You know, what are they going to be thinking about in terms of Starfleet regulations when they get into new and dangerous situations? So now we have uh, more general regulations rather than general orders. So there's some sample regulations here, like upon encountering an unknown life form or being that demonstrates cognitive ability and the qualif qualifications of sentience, every step should be taken to initiate first contact within the boundaries of General Order One. Right. So if you meet alien life, try to be nice to it um, and you know try to establish good relations as long as that doesn't break the Prime Directive. Okay. And then there's samples of standing orders. So you know these are orders that can be set sort of in a specific mission or in a specific sector, right? So in, for example, Directive 252 Bajor Sector, by order of Admiral Necheyev, personnel with any knowledge of the resistance group known as the Maquis or their operatives are to report such information to their superior officer immediately because in the Bajor Sector, the Maquis are a big problem. They're a kind of rebellion against uh, Federation interference in the Bajoran conflict. And so any information you get, you have to report to the captain immediately. Uh, well, to the Admiral or whoever their superior officer is. Then they give samples of guidelines. So there are numerous guidelines for all kinds of things from, you know, transporter usage to, you know, replicator usage. And they give you some little snippets here. They give you samples of that. All this is great for world building for the GM as well, by the way. And then we go into sort of the forms of address for officers, you know, and the details of how you should address superior officers and different operational modes that you might go into besides what was laid out in the core book. So an intruder alert, which is similar to yellow alert, but basically all non-essential personnel are confined to their quarters. Movement through the ship requires the authorization of immediate officers and armed security teams patrol each deck. So when somebody breaks through onto the ship, um, you go into a yellow alert type state, but basically you're, you're confined to quarters and you're, you have patrols sent out to try and clear out the intruders. I mean, you can have a quarantine situation where uh, you know an alien disease has abandoned the ship. And then of course you have the abandoned ship order if the ship is in extreme danger and, and the ship might be lost with all hands, then they, they will start to evacuate the ship in the lifeboats. They'll launch lifeboats and there'll be a copy of the ship log sent out to a subspace transmitter and the ship can be self-destructed. Then we have details about contact protocols, another day in the life. This, this is of a lieutenant, a tactical officer, and policies that affect tactical. So, so when conflict becomes a little unavoidable, you know, what do they do? How do they handle their deflector shields? 
phasers and photon torpedoes. You know, th- th- there's more background here for communications officers, diplomatic protocol, and then uh, daily lives of line officers and staff officers. So here we have a day in the life of Lieutenant Patrick Cottrell, chief engineer. Um, you know, some details about an officer's duty. So qualities such as integrity, discipline, skill, resourcefulness, and initiative make a good officer. Blah, blah, blah. What can happen if you don't display those things or disregard Starfleet Code of Conduct? Duties of an officer and duty watches. Maintenance on the Starship, which is, of course, extremely important. Starships are complex, incredibly specialized machines with millions and millions of parts. And everything needs to be kept in perfect working order so that some tiny error doesn't creep through and kill everyone. So then there's review and inspections. So this can happen uh, when... You know, admirals or superior officers may come and send somebody to hold an uh, inspection of staff and inspections of the, the review of the, the ship itself. Every day, there will be reports to the captain from the chief engineer reporting on the status of the ship, all that kind of stuff. Of course, everybody is expected to keep reports and logs on everything that they've done. And here we have examples. So a ship log from the USS Gallant, from the chief of operations management, Lieutenant Commander Catherine Romano. Then we have our personal log. And the same again here, we have executive officer, the, the basically Riker person, Commander Wade Garrett reporting, talking about the, uh, the status of the ship and personal log as well, about what they've done during the day. Um, all this stuff, you know, is, is things we've seen in the show. It kind of brings it down to a more personal level and enables you to kind of expand that part of your character and for the GM to really help in the world building process as well, making each day in the life on the ship feel more realistic. Now we get into the crunch. Here we go. So we got expanded character creation. We've got an, ex- an expanded rule for promotion revisited. So the promotion advantage has been enhanced to provide a method in which characters can earn points during play, allowing them to gradually work up to their next promotion. So basically... There are some programs that you can take part in that will build up points towards promotion. So, for example, uh, Kami's character, Lieutenant Darian Dior, has five points of promotion and attends bridge certification training, receiving a plus one bonus or promotion advantage. This raises her total to six, causing her character to rise to the rank of Lieutenant Commander. Uh, and then they have the ranks and costs listed here. So Lieutenant Commander, of course, is a cost of six. So basically, now you have a way to directly build towards promotions by entering certain programs. So rather than it kind of happening at a certain point in the key story or when the GM feels that you're kind of worthy worthy of it, um, you can actually try and build your career yourself, which is a, a nice sort of advanced rule to include, I think, for players that, you know, are... are kind of driven by the advancement of their characters. You can also have uh, an optional rule for an expanded cadet cruise history, giving them a bit more background experience. You can combine skills in play. So there's a rule here for zero level skills. With zero level skills, the rules now allow a character to know a little about a narrow subject, but nothing about the broader scope. So a character with culture, Vulcan 01, knows something of Vulcan culture, but knows nothing about other planets. This costs one development points. Uh, with zero level skills, characters may not raise their specialization beyond the first level. They must first acquire a skill level in the base skill. But this is interesting because during character generation, you can then buy these zero level skills, giving you a little bit of some specific experience in areas that you wouldn't normally touch on. And then those can be combined. So if you have uh, a skill and a zero level skill with the same specialization, you can add them together you know, during your uh, character building process. So it's an interesting option to have. It seems like a real sort of in maxi kind of thing. I'm not sure, you know, that I would use that particularly often, but it is an interesting option to have. And also it makes for interesting character ideas, right? You might have somebody who they really don't care about history, except they really love the history of the Klingon Empire, right? And you can now represent that by having a, you know, level zero history skill with a level one specialization in Klingon history, right? So, so interesting stuff like that can happen. You can also customize the packages, skill packages that are available in the game. Um, and then we have some advanced training programs. So there are expanded options for early life history. So there's new options here, like uh, you were raised affluent, you were a grease monkey, you were kidnapped, you were athletically inclined, you were a performer, privateer, a savant, scientific upbringing, or well-traveled. There are new Advantages, disadvantages, and skills associated with those. Um, You have expanded academy life history options as well. So you have advanced computer and AI design, uh, diplomacy training, emergency medical training, interspecies relations, leadership development, marksmanship certificate, rapid progress training, rapid response training, sorry, and Red Squad. So this is kind of Starship tactics, vehicle operations, that sort of stuff. Um, So again, 
Lots more options for player characters. This is your uh, crunch for the expanded cadet cruise history optional rule. So there's new types of cadet cruises that you can undergo. Border patrol, combat duty, convoy duty, courier mission, deep space exploration, diplomatic mission, extended training, heroic actions, medical relief, section leader, shakedown cruise, uh, and undiscovered conspiracy. Each of those costing four development points. Uh, but they give you some advantages and, and possible disadvantages. And then you can expand your tour of duty history as well. So there are some new tour of duty packages for your first tour, and you have additional tours for your second option as well. Things like hostile duty, intelligent recruitment, uh, intelligence recruitment, uncharted space exploration, you know, surveying new worlds, all this kind of stuff. So really great for, again, for PCs to, to bulk up their characters, give them uh, their own kind of special personality. So using the advanced training packages, so it just sort of explains how these new elements work. You have advanced legal training, advanced medical training, advanced tactical training, so the School of Diplomacy, the Exocultural Relations School, the Officer Candidate School, OCS, the Officer Exchange Program, uh, the Strategic Operations, and the Vulcan Science Academy. So these allow you to sort of further specialize in the related areas of Starfleet operations. You also have an optional rule for expanded advanced training. So then you have rules for advanced training and commanding officers. So if your narrator, narrator allows you to build your characters with varying development point totals, you may want to consider using the optional advanced training programs as yet another way to create command level characters, such as department chiefs, executive officers, and captains. In addition, you can use this method to simulate realistically the advanced training some Starfleet officers receive. Starfleet doctors, for example, can attend Starfleet Medical Academy in, in addition to their other training. So now we have these new options to really get kind of high-level bridge officers with just top-notch training. So step one, you know, what's your character concept? Step two, choose your basic character, so the, the template and overlay. Step three, background. You're going to go early life, academy life, branch officer training, then bridge certification training. Then officers destined to become command personnel on board a starship or starbase must attend this school. And then your tour of duty. And now for your advanced training programs... So you have the, the new ones mentioned before, the advanced legal training. You have the uh, advanced medical training. You have advanced tactical training. And again, these are all the, the kind of outcomes of different tracks you can take in those areas. So you might specialize in, you know, Klingon anatomy or stuff like that. In tactical training, you might specialize in starship training or tactical ordnance, like, which would give you skills in demolitions, heavy weapons, etc. So you can really specialize your character even further. On the Daystrom Institute, then you can learn about archaeology, computer design, cybernetics, and genetics. If you're going to the School of Diplomacy, you can specialize in exocultural affairs, so that's working with other species, intergalactic affairs, so this will be kind of galaxy-wide diplomacy, I suppose, and the study of political science at a larger scale, or you can study mediation. Um, in the exocultural relations, you can study cultural advisory, you can be a first contact specialist, survey team, uh, field officer, survey team operations, for officer candidate school, basically everybody has to do this if you want to be a bridge officer. So you have to have a requirements and then you can choose the, uh, get the benefits of OCS down below. You can do the officer exchange program as well. So you'll get to spend some time on a different fleet with the Andorians, the Benzites, the Klingons, or the uh, Vulcans, which is really interesting. So if you have that guy who's got a level zero skill in Klingon history, Maybe he spends some time on his officer exchange going to the Klingon Defense Forces. Then he gets cultural, cultural Klingon, language Klingon. He learns about um, Klingon Defense Force regulations. He learns about Klingon starship tactics. And he reduces his chronic pain. So not, not a bad deal, right? You can do strategic operations training. So learn about the Borg, defensive operations and strategies, intelligence monitoring, and threat forces. And if you go to the Vulcan Science Academy, galactically renowned for their abilities in the sciences, the, you do work for planetary surveys, subspace dynamics, temporal studies, if you want to specialize in time travel. Loads of really, really cool options, basically. And then there's some final touches as well. So now we get into the bridge certification stuff. So bridge certification training, branch officer training, command school, uh, and the medical academy. So... Branch officer training, this is basically, these are kind of more generalized. So if you're going to be, if you're learning about administering personnel in a department, basically, then this is the training that you're going to get to reach that level. To spend time on the bridge, you have to be an officer already, minimum rank of lieutenant. Then you can train up with this bridge certification training to um, give you plus one promotion. So now we're getting to the stuff that allows you to build up your promotion stat. Uh, if you go to command school for 14 weeks, when you fulfill all these various requirements, minimum 15 renown, positive discipline aspect, etc., then you can get all these skills built up and promotion plus two. Starfleet Medical Academy is a great deal for 
the uh, medical officer side of things. You get a huge amount of new skills. Um, you must be from the medical branch of medical specialization, obviously, but you can learn about cybernetics, treatment, exobiology, uh, GP practices, uh, which gets you a promotion point as well. You know, a plus one promotion as well for a surgeon or, uh, you know, all kinds of interesting stuff can happen to you. So now you've got all these advanced programs that can happen to build you up to really be a top-notch command officer. And then you have uh, post-training with these new programs that allows you to build up towards the next level in your career as well, which is pretty cool. It also gives you some advice about how to handle all this as a narrator so that, you're, you know, of course... Uh, Players will, players will be players, and players want a power game, so just uh, make sure that, you know, you take account of that. And there's also some advice here about uh, previous experience, so, you know, you can make use of the background history stages. There is an effective age as well, so if you're going to incorporate previous experience, then you can have suggested skills by profession. So, you know, if you spent your life as a doctor, you may, uh, maybe you joined Starfleet after that. So you have some, you know, background in some of these areas prior to that. Same if you started as a lawyer, entertainer, or merchant in the military, or a pilot, a scientist, or in some kind of technical uh, background, you know, engineering or simulation, different kind of sciences. You know, there's so many options here to help build your character's background into something pretty individualized, interesting. And then there's, of course, the uh, crunch results of that, so they're different skills and attributes that you can gain through that process. And there are sort of critical ages for the main species that are available, including the, the ones in this book. Um, so that's where you really start to kind of pass your prime. You know, for humans, uh, 65. But if you're a Grazerite, it'll be 100. You know, uh, for a Vulcan, it'll be 150 because they have a long time. So if you're using the advanced training programs in lieu of Academy Life, at four years of the character's age. So there will be some, you know, pluses and minuses to using these different systems. If you have critical age, then you gain some malices here. If you're critical age plus 15, you gain some more. Critical age plus 30, you're going to have chronic pain, medical problems, slow healing, lots of other stuff. So you can train yourself for a good long time, have lots of background skills, but the older you are, the more messed up you'll be. <laughs> then, of course, there is advanced characterization character creation rules that incorporate all this new stuff uh, and they have lovely examples throughout as per usual now we get some new species so you get the benzites a little bit about their history uh, of course we've got a lovely illustration here about their culture and physiology noted accomplishments as a species and then we have their template so they are fully playable as a a background uh, or, or ancestry i guess we would say nowadays uh, is a politically correct way to say it we have betelgusians who like to play 3D, 3D chess, apparently, I guess. Um, and they're a template. So, let's see, they are weak in Psy, pretty, a little bit better in coordination, pretty average in most things. But yeah, they do have some unique skills as well. Um, actually, we didn't give the Benzite a fair shake. Yeah, they also start with no Psy, uh, but they've got a good, good intellect and some useful skills, including administration, uh, culture, Benzite, history, Benzite, engineering, any, one and two, that's pretty good. Um, so, you know, as, as always, each template comes with its own pluses and minuses. We have the Cairn. They live on a mysterious world of endless forests and woodlands, the fourth planet in the Visium system. Okay. Okay, so playing a Cairn provides a role-playing challenge for players. Interesting. So, instead of the calls and cries typical of most planets, fauna, varite animals send simple mental messages to one another. So, they don't maintain a writing, written history or any kind of writing at all. Their collective memories are long and accurate. So they're telepathic species. So that makes uh, for uh, the role-playing challenge aspect. And you can see they start with a psi of two and a range plus one for that as well. So they're, and they're already starting with projective telepathy three, which is pretty strong. Um, they can only project images and only to other Cairn and non-Cairn with receptive telepathy. So with others of the species, they can communicate in this way, but um, with other species, they will have to find some way to communicate verbally or find receptive beings uh, that can at least receive their mental messages. You got the Gray's Rites. He's, he's got a bucket full of weird tube things. Don't know why. His skills, he has a decent presence, which can go all the way up to six, actually, and strong empathy, which is good. Has some life sciences skills, good at mediation and persuasion. So those are these are good, kind of extremely patient diplomatic types. So good fit for that. Katarians. 
So I guess they're, they're known for uh, its glaciers. Okay. They're humanoids rec recognizable by their feline eyes, prominent frontal lobes, and cranial ridges running from the crest of the forehead to the back of the skull. So your standard wrinkly forehead, Star Trek aliens. They have good coordination. They have good presence. Uh, no sigh. They're good at bargaining, gaming, and gambling, and the rest are all kind of specialized skills for their culture. They gain the traits innovative, multitasking, and impulsive. Interesting. Now we have the Napaeans. Got this guy here. I guess they're more warlike, given he's carrying a phaser rifle. So there's a new disadvantage for Napian characters. They have involuntary projective empathy. Okay. So unless the character maintains a state of constant concentration, he will send his own emotions to all sentient beings within 20 meters. Uh, the narrator may require a willpower test whenever the character suffers stress or must devote his full attention to some other matter. Okay. So uh, the difficulty of the test will correlate with the level of stress they're under. So if the character is dying, it'll be nearly impossible for them to broad not broadcast their despair. Whereas if they just kind of casually bump into somebody, it might, he might be annoyed, but it won't be too easy to too hard to suppress. That's interesting. Uh, as far as stats go, they have good fitness, good intellect, Psy of three, which is pretty good. I think it's even better than the starting for Vulcans and Beta Zets. They have receptive empathy, and they have the traits of patron, sense of time, and this new disadvantage, the involuntary projective empathy, which we discussed, and they are pacifists as well. And the patron should be the character's Nepean mentor. So I guess there's a, a deep respect for the student-mentor relationship on their home planet of Nepea. Then we have the Zakdorn. Uh, the original homeworld of the civilization of the same name was rendered uninhabitable by a terrorist attack in 2170. So they have since scattered, I suppose. As a species, they have strong intellect and presence uh, with willpower bonus, but less empathy. Empathy. They can choose one intellect or presence skill uh, at a two and a three with any specialization. That's pretty good. They also can choose any science specialization. I guess they're quite worldly being they've had to scatter from their original homes, unfortunately. They can choose one of a number of possible traits. So engineering aptitude, mathematical aptitude, scientific genius, plus three. These are all plus threes, actually. Or disadvantage of arrogant minus one, competitive minus one. Or they also get plus four renown, which is pretty cool. So then we have the Zaldans. Looks like this. I kind of like this illustration. It's a bit like sort of... 60s retro future sort of vibes and got a mysterious orb so there's the stats they've got good fitness decent dexterity a bonus they got a willpower bonus again not very empathetic so maybe not suited for diplomacy good at swimming they've got a water culture and they're good at planet side survival in the ocean so there you go they've got an excellent metabolism and high lung capacity so that can help them and that's a new advantage so a character can hold his breath for up to 15 minutes without effort or ill effect at 15 minutes he must make a willpower test each minute to suppress the urge to breathe and and back in again. The difficulty begins at four routine and increases by two for each subsequent minute. Wow, okay. So definitely one to bring with you to a aquatic planet. So that's your new species. Then we've got new skills and traits as well. So we've got new command skills like mediation, which we've seen mentioned already earlier in the book. Under operations, we've got weaponsmith. So you can build, repair, and modify weapons. It applies to personal weapons only. Uh, ship's weapons are, are different matter entirely. Other skills, you can have concealment as an intellect skill, so hiding things so they're difficult to find. Uh, instruction, presence skill, so um, you're good at teaching, basically. Knowledge, a catch-all skill reflecting a character's general knowledge of some obscure or interesting subject. Uh, and again, as with all the skills, we have some examples of di the different difficulty levels and possible specializations. Mimicry, presence, so you can mimic another person's voice sounds of a person or animal. You can have a politics skill under intellect as well. So it also encompasses political psychology, the practice of manipulating a large group of people. See the Way of Darrow, which is the Romulan uh, box set for a more com complete explanation of this skill. Uh, you can also have surveillance. So this is about bugging and shadowing somebody, following them around, learning their movements. Throwing objects is a fitness skill. You can throw grenades or knives or whatever. And then we have some throwing ranges with sample difficulties as well. Uh, there's a new tracking skill. How to follow an animal or person based on the traces they leave behind. We have ventriloquism. So you can throw your voice. Um, that seems fairly uh, not that useful, but you never know. And then there's some new rules for specializations. You can actually eliminate specializations, which seems strange to me. I mean, it's kind of a core element of the game. And then there's some new and existing specializations. So you can have acrobatics with a specialization of break fall. So it allows you to take reduced damage from falls. You have to roll a test, obviously. But, uh, you know, if you can manage to roll a 15, you could fall 31 meters and not 
kill yourself, which is pretty good. You can take acrobatics, gymnastics, artistic expression through acting, um, behavior modification via hypnotism. That's pretty cool. Um, you can implant post-hypnotic suggestions, and there's some uh, table of difficulty modifiers for those for how long the suggestion will stay in effect. There's a dodge skill variation, espionage, observation, intimidation through cross-examination, the use of primitive weaponry. So they're kind of expanding on some skills here. So you could, you know, expand your specializations under primitive weaponry, um, including the Chakra Ramdal, which is Andorian knife fighting fencing from Old Earth. And you have the details of those uh, laid out here on this table. For, there's an optional rule for primitive weaponry and unarmed combat. There's some new skills for shipboard systems under command. Shipboard systems under tactical weapon systems and defensive systems specializations. More info on unarmed combat, such as secret, secret techniques and special moves. And there's some new styles. So there's Aikido, boxing, brawling, karate, kung fu, Nozgan pit fighting. Sounds painful. Starfleet Martial Arts, uh, Tatharok, or Regellian Karate, or Wrestling, if you want to do lots of grappling and throwing. Uh, and there's some new traits as well for you to choose. So some new advantages like artistic talent. You can get new kinds of assets. So these can be an ancestral home or family heirloom or an astro archaeological memento. Although you begin the game with this benefit, you can lose it through the course of gameplay. So be careful with that. And then we have details about the new combat maneuvers that are available to you if you take the new specialization. So in Aikido, you can block, you can lock joints, take down and throw. Advanced maneuvers include joint break, ouch, and redirect. So redirect somebody's energy in a very Aikido sort of way. With boxing, you can do hooks, uppercuts, uh, the jackhammer, uh, plus one damage for a hook or uppercut, or a lightning cross. For brawling, you get some new actions. The hammer punch. Oh, that's the, the double-fisted Kirk punch. I love that. Then in karate, of course, you get different kinds of punches and snap kicks. Uh, the knife hand strike, karate chop. And Tatharok, you get uh, headbutts and kicks, rake punches and throws. For Kung Fu, you get lots of stuff. You get chops, grabs, joint locks, disarm movements, uh, throws and leg sweeps, dragon tiger claw, flying kicks, and the uh, Tien Hu Sue strike. Strikes the vital points, causing great pain, but no lasting damage. 2d6 stun damage, ouch. Um, Nazgun pit fighting, you can eye gouge. Uh, or groin blow. That sounds pretty dirty. Yeah, and then Starfleet Martial Arts. You have your block punch, strike and throw, choke hold, and disarm maneuver. And for wrestling, you have uh, escaping from a grab, initiating a grab, doing a sacrifice throw, a slam, and you can do a reversal if somebody does a grab on you. And there are special techniques to maintain a grab uh, or to do a pile driver, which is a plus one damage to your slam. Pretty cool. Yep, and then we have some more traits, uh, battle-hardened, uh, cultural flexibility, if you've had a, a youth or a life of running around many different worlds, deep cover, so if you have a well-developed alternate identity, usually you won't have this unless you're part of Starfleet Intelligence. You can be a lightning-fast calculator. You can be a line officer, which gives you an advantage, the cost of the advantage, and sort of, so being a line officer costs one to four uh, development points. You have to have certain minimum ranks and a certain class of ship, basically. Um, you can have tolerance for particular substance or substances. So you can be resistant to mildly dangerous alcohols and stuff, common and or dangerous substances like Romulan, ale, most serpent, venoms, <laughs> and uh, very common and or very dangerous substances such as, such as poisons. Uh, you can be psionically gifted, an unusual uh, high level of skill and ability with mental powers. You may roll one extra die whenever making a test with any psionic skill. Cool. You can have security clearance to get restricted information more easily, uh, as if you were of a higher rank, basically. Um, you can be a scientific genius, you can have a sixth sense, you can be uh, disadvantaged wise, you can have an addiction, which could be to any number of things. Uh, you might have amnesia, you're forgetful, you might have a bad reputation, you're competitive, you're domineering, you're an expatriate, so you know, you feel a pull to your your original place where you came from. You might have an overwhelming sense of guilt about something you've done. You might be imprudent or inept. You might be power hungry. Um, you might have a formal reprimand on your Starfleet record. You might be wanted by some system for something you've done. You might be wrongfully accused. And then there's some modifications to old traits as well. And some tips on building the perfect NPC, developing recurring characters and primary NPCs that will appear frequently in a given series. And then commendations. So these are revised rules. 
So it modifies the list of accommodations presented in the core rulebook. Uh, originally, these merely served as bragging rights but provided no concrete advantage to gameplay. Now, characters earn some renown along with their commendation. So the cost and development points to buy one of these awards as an advantage uh, is under the cost column. The renown gives you the amount of renown uh, when you receive this advantage. And then this shows the rewards. So uh, if you're a narrator who wish to give out commendations as a result of good role-playing. So that'll give you a suggested renown award. So a selection of possible awards. You've got the Christopher Pike Medal of Honor... Uh, the Golden Palm, so crewmen who stay at their stations and do their duty even in times of extreme peril. Uh, the Grand Kite Order of Tactics, the Kragite Order of Heroism, Medal of Honor, and all these on the chart here. So you have uh, the award itself, the renown you gain, and the rewards that you can get as well. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. Um, and finally, we have some more details about enlisted personnel in Starfleet. So enlisted officers like uh, Mr. Barclay there, you can be... In different positions, operations, engineering, security, you can be uh, specialists in different areas in each of those areas, and you have different ranks for enlisted crewmen. So you can be a recruit, crewman second class, up through petty officer ranks, chief petty officer, and then master chief petty officer at the top. If you create enlisted personnel, there's some advice on how to do that here, and use them in your series, and of course you have some training packages to create those as well. Yeah, I mean, there's a ton of options in Crunch in this book. They really, they don't skimp on that. And you can also, of course, use enlisted characters as a supporting cast. I would recommend that. I think most characters don't want to play, I mean, Lower Decks is a great show, but, you know, in a system like this, where, you know, the glory is out there in, like, fighting aliens and, you know, curing diseases from planets and all that kind of stuff, playing on the Lower Decks of the ship is not going to give you the kind of challenges that the game is really set up for. So it'd be better to um, use enlisted characters as a supporting cast. You might interact with them a lot. They'll like they could have be the voice of the narrator in various situations, but um, probably not necessarily where you want to be as a player character. Then we have some additional psionic powers and the introduction of the Federal Institu Federation Institute for Paranormal Aptitude and how you can gain psionics and character generation. Then we have some new powers. These are cascade abilities. So many of these are extensions of other psionic disciplines. So you need to have... For example, mind control to, to learn illusion creation. So those are they're just prerequisites, but they're called cascade abilities for some reason. The prerequisite skill must be known at level three or higher, since mastery of this prerequisite is necessary before the student can move on to more advanced disciplines. So what do we got? We've got stuff like far seeing. This is a cascade ability of visions. You can actually see and hear the target as though physically present. So it's remote viewing, basically. Um, precognition. So again, uh, prerequisite would be visions, and here you can see into the future. It's possible to receive visions only about events which are highly likely. That doesn't mean they don't necessarily occur, of course. Under the empathy category, you can have an empathic attack. So if you have projective empathy, you can actually um, use your empathic ability to, to send bad emotions to others. By focusing his rage, hatred, and other negative feelings at a single target, the empath can literally harm the target with these emotions. There you go. On the flip side of that, you have empathic healing. So if you, again, have receptive empathy instead of projective, uh, instead of simply receiving emotions, you can more literally take the subject's pain and even physical damage from the subject. So depending on the difficulty you roll, you can help heal a patient using your, your empathic ability, which is pretty awesome. Uh, you can also create a mind shield uh, using psionic negation. So if you have mind shield already, um, psionic negation, possibly because of its widely renowned will and determination, this ability can only be learned by humans. Interesting. It's possible to make yourself and anyone or anything nearby temporarily immune to psionic effects. Uh, there's another cascade ability of Mind Shield, which is Reflective Mind Shield. If the psionic succeeds in an opposed test against an attempted intrusion, any psionic ability used against him is reflected back at the attacking psionic. So a telekinetic blast would bounce back at the opponent, which is pretty awesome. Uh, if you have projective telepathy, you can then get a cascade ability called Illusion Creation. You can create convincing realistic illusions. So creating a full sensory landscape or a realistic person or uh, altering an object's appearance. You can create a phaser where none exists. Uh, disguise an isolinear chip's presence by making it invisible or turning it into something else. But to, to maintain the illusion requires full concentration by the psionic character. If you want to affect more people with the illusion, then that increases the difficulty as well. And then they give some examples of how difficult it will be for those illusions to maintain. Uh, you can also induce people into a trance. So you can allow telepaths to confuse and distract a single t subject temporarily. The psionic selects a single target and projects a barrage of confusing and hypnotic in images into his mind. If the test is successful, the target becomes temporarily disoriented, entering a relaxed, almost hypnotic state. 
All attempts to use additional psionic powers on a subject in this state receive a minus two to their difficulty. So it makes somebody kind of hypnotic, into a hypnotic trance and flustered, easy to affect with your further powers. As a cascade ability of psychosense, or of receptive telepathy rather, you can have psychosense. Now, again, learned only by humans. It allows the psionic to locate living minds within range similar to a scan with a tricorder. It also reveals life forms which are sapient and which are not. Uh, so that's a really useful ability if you're investigating a new and scary planet or location. Under telekinesis, so now you can move objects with the power of thought alone. Of course, the difficulty will depend on the size and weight of that object. So trying to move something up to 500 kilograms would be nearly impossible, basically. You can also throw objects telekinetically, but you use difficulty set as per the range combat table uh, and modify the target number by the object's weight. I'll give you some examples here. You can also perform... Electro manipulation, so another cascade ability, this time from telekinesis. And only members of powerful psionic species such as Betazoids, Vulcans, and the Cairn can learn this rare ability. Uh, you focus the mind precisely enough to affect the op operation of complex electronic, duotronic, and isolinear circuitry. So basically you can operate and turn on and off uh, electronics. So you can control complex personal devices, like even like phasers. Um, you can control systems on s a small but complex vehicle like shuttlecraft. At the highest level of difficulty, you can control a system on a starship, starbase, search facility, or any large, exceedingly complex computer. Another cascade ability of telekinesis is telekinetic manipulation. So you can manipulate the d distant objects with fine degree of control. So you can only affect a living being as a single unit. Um, but you can do things like uh, use medical equipment, tie a knot, or pick a lock from a distance. Uh, and then you finally have cas a cascade ability of telekinesis called thermokinesis, so you can heat or cool small objects by altering their molecular motion using your mind. That's pretty cool. Um, and then we have some character archetypes. So this provides players and narrators with ready-made archetypes for some of the new professions introduced in The Price of Freedom and the Starfleet Intelligence Operatives in the first line. So uh, we have some templates for a human rapid response officers with their you know kind of full character build set up for you here. We have some new uh, equipment. Russian phaser rifle. We have the force shield and portable tactical display. Then we have the Benzite rapid field medic. They have, of course, a possible build here, and they can have a individual force field generator, it seems like. Uh, then we have the human shuttlecraft pilot and enlisted officer. Um, so they specialize in shuttlecraft duty, and they have emergency beacons. Standard issue on all shuttlecraft runabouts and scout ships. They have an engineering kit with a variety of basic tools for repair and maintenance. And they have gravitic cal cal calipers, which regulate or rewrote the plasma flow to certain systems through the generation of graviton field. Okay. You'd also be a human scientist. And they have a sample character here. Uh, and they carry with them a Polaron probe, which can be used to detect localized subspace anomalies and affect the force field's polarity. And a portable computer, which is more powerful than a tricorder or a pad. Uh, and a spectrometric scanner. Or you can be a Napaean intelligence operative. So it gives you a sample background. Again, the possible uh, list of skills, traits, etc. And you are carrying with you an exographic sensor. So it allows you to see distant objects through solid matter by using neutrinos to convey the video signal through intervening obstacles very handy for a spy, isn't it? They've got a holdout phaser, so it's been stripped down to an essential component so it can be easily disassembled to escape detection. Put it together and get a couple of shots out of it in an extreme situation. And you've got a Verteron inducer, which interrupts electrical fields by creating a localized feed up feedback loop. Uh, so they can short out electronic equipment. So if you get locked away, you can short out a door access control or something like that. Uh, then we have a human first contact specialist. With a nice full character build here and background, personality. Then they have data recorders, isolation suits, and a social science extended tricorder. That's cool. So they've got a holographic camera capable of 4.5 hours of sequential image storage. Significantly higher resolution reduces the storage capacity accordingly. They have an isolation suit, which includes a transponder. It absorbs EM admissions. Uh, and they also have this extended tricorder. So it consists of a standard base unit to which it adds a specialized peripheral device, which adds powerful sensors and analysis functions tailored to a specific discipline. So this has been expanded to include a variety of readings from the medical peripheral, allowing for readings of total body mechanical processes, organ system function, and body electromagnetic conditions, as well as a dedicated social science database. 
So that allows you to look up information on political, social, economic, and anthropological data for 220 known humanoid species. Very useful. And then there's some rules for ministry use, uh, using hexes, setting explosion markers up, you know, dealing with hex movement maneuvers. I'm not going to go through any of this because who cares, really? Um, and some new rules. So you can create high-ranking characters right out the bat. And they want, you know, they offer this ability along with the enlisted characters so that you can basically create any kind of Star Trek TNG story that you want. So it becomes easier to conceive of creating a higher ranked character with the character creation system as it is now. So you might want to play the captain of a galaxy class starship or the chief engineer of a sovereign class. But the narrator should make sure that the character's positions don't class. Clash, I mean, there can only be one captain and one XO. So somebody would have to change their minds if they both want to be captains. Um, but all this new stuff with advanced training, it's possible to right out the gate be a high-ranking officer on a high-ranking ship. The thorniest issue of playing a high-ranked character at the beginning of the game is a question of renown. Captains and other high-ranking characters tend to have earned a lot of renown. Some may be even legends, like Jack Captain James T. Kirk. A uh, starting character with a single point of renown hasn't got that sort of attention yet. But, you know, the guidelines set down during the rewards chapter refer to characters advancing during gameplay. So nothing says in the rules says a character must have 60 renown to be a captain. So, you know... If after the game starts, characters should qualify for promotions in the normal fashion. And then if you go through this advanced training track, you'll gain um, ranks in your promotion skill as well. So there are other ways to move up the ladder rather than just making yourself a living legend. Here's some additional narrator considerations for the new rules introduced. Uh, and then a system for starship renown. So that's kind of interesting. Um, you know, the, the Enterprise has developed a name for itself and became the Federation's sort of iconic flagship. So now you can have Starship Renown checks, basically. <laughs> so if you make a Renown check uh, during a ship encounter, then let's say you roll up with the Enterprise D. Everybody knows the Enterprise D. So uh, it's going to have a high level of ship Renown, meaning that uh, when the other side, the narrator, rolls for them to test whether they know this ship, they will probably know that the Enterprise is a big deal. Uh, but if you have a lesser ship of the Nebula class or something, they may think you're nobody and uh, treat you with more more brusquely, shall we say. Um, that's a really cool idea, and I think that adds to spatial encounters, right? When you go encounter somebody ship to ship. Um, then have some example ship renown values. Uh, so the Enterprise E has accomplishment 46, force 15, science 19, interaction 11, uh, and the base renown is 9, so it's very high. The USS Defiant has a base starship renown of 7. We've got some new ranged combat maneuvers. So covering fire, if you want to protect an indicated area, uh, any character entering the area will automatically be hit by a blast from the weapon and take damage. So it'll allow you to you know, cover areas, help your friends move around the, uh, the firing area. Um, you can double fire, so two quick shots. You can get the drop on somebody, so you have to place yourself correctly and kind of roll a challenging dodge test to get the drop on them. Um, some ranged weapons can bounce or ricochet their projectile or beam, so then you can get around cover, basically. Uh, you can use the snapshot to fire at opposition while taking advantage of full physical cover. Uh, so this is when you're hiding behind something and you just sort of quickly pop up, snap off a shot. Then you can use wide beams against multiple, character, uh, multiple par targets if you're using phasers. Um, certain kind of phases can do that. You also have options for explosions and explosives. So photon grenades, what happens if you miss with an explosive? And then uh, a category of different possible types of explosions. Their damage radius, the drop-off and damage per meter, and the damage at the epicenter, basically. Um, and then there's different kinds of explosions uh, described in more detail. So infernite, um, locator bombs, phaser overloads, if you set your phaser to overload and blow up, uh, photon grenades, which are described in the Price of Freedom, which we'll get to next time. Yeah, and other things like trilithium explosives, which are uh, very powerful, and some common uh, explosive effects, explosive decompression, damaged starship panels, overloaded EPS conduits, starship or station destruction, but it would take a lot of explosives to do that, uh, or a warp core breach, of course, that would be uh, particularly terrible. Then you can combine explosives. Uh, then finally, we have some new rules for administering medicines and drugs. Uh, there's a possibility of overdose, which would send people into comas and other bad things. Um, there's different kinds of drugs here and what their effects are. So if you're a medical character, you might want to have these this table handy so you know what to give in a different situation. You can give you know, cardiostimulatory or strength-enhancing injections, pain resistance, uh, anesthetic agents, sedatives and pain relief. Uh, or counteracting vertigo and things like that. Uh, and then finally, we have the Starship Starbase 315 setting. So we have all the stats for the Starbase here. 
um, descriptions of the different sections of the Starbase. So it's kind of like getting a bit of DS9 in um, the TNG era. And you also have uh, a Talon class starship assigned to you as well. You have a supporting cast of a mixture of Federation officers and some members of Starship Intelligence. You have some scientists and civilians as well. You've got a merchant marine arm, contact with the diplomatic service, and then it describes some of the challenges in the surrounding Beitao sector. Uh, so it's really cool. You know, the, the book gives you so, so many options uh, to take your character in new directions, uh, including to highly advanced levels, and then gives you a whole new method of play, basically, uh, with a well-described sector around a star base, which then ends with a tease for Deep Space Nine, which I think is pretty cool. So, yeah, there you go. That's the player's guide, redundantly, with player aid there at the bottom, just, just in case you didn't notice that. Uh, again, great book for players, useful stuff for GMs as well. Um, narrator guidance is sort of interspersed throughout with the new rules. Um, highly recommend getting it. I paid about £20 for it, so hopefully you can get it for a decent price wherever you are as well. Next time, we will look at the price of freedom. Look forward to that. In the meantime, take care, be well, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. All right, take care, bye-bye.